Welcome everyone to our final uh, webinar for the RAN Women's Online Forum. Our topic today is recruit and retain more female coaches and referees. And then uh, our other fantastic panelists tonight is Tamara Dixon um, from Canada, who is also, um, she's the co-founder and current player of the Guardian Angels, uh, which is a women's club team based in the greater Toronto area. She is uh, a capped rugby player for the Jamaican Rugby Union and also is a capped Canadian bobsledder uh, as well. She's been coaching for 17 years and playing for 23. Uh, so we're going to get into the topic of how do we get more women involved in coaching and refereeing? Amazing, thank you for the introduction, Erin, and thank you for the opportunity. Maria Thomas, thank you for the suggestion. I also wanna thank all the women who had amazing webinars the weeks before, uh, very interesting and so much knowledge presented. So uh, here we are with week four with our information and I'm excited to share and, uh, and see uh, how we take this information moving forward. So I'm going to provide my... So let's just share my screen. All right. And okay. So you let me know if you can see what uh, we can see your screen. All right. Amazing. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a look at a not so traditional way of how to recruit and retain coaches and referees. And so uh, what we're going to take a look at is um, our rugby program. So here uh, you can, um, let's uh, go back here. Yeah. So here uh, are the names of the other co-founders. So you have Devine Burton, Dr. Karen Crowback, and myself. Um, and one of the reasons why we wanted to start this program is obviously to give women a chance to be at the table at different levels. And so we're going to kind of take a look at how we did that as, as we move forward. So here are the wonderful women that were involved. You have Devine Burton on the left, Karen, Dr. Karen Crowback on the right. Uh, that photo was actually taken when uh, we were warming up for our first game and we just looked at each other and said, we did it. Like it's actually happening. And uh, so that was a candid moment. Um, the photo on the left here with Devine Burton um, was uh, interesting because you have two of the founding players um, there in the line out. You have Nat Ben David, Rose, uh, Rose Baker, and both of those players were part of the, uh, the movement. Uh, they also raised some issues in terms of wanting the team, the club that we all kind of discussed. And so um, us moving forward with this program, it was really amazing to have them be a part of that as well. So let's take a look at uh, the first situation here that we're going to look at is, is why would women want to, um, you know, play for a club such as ours, the Guardian Angels? What are some of the issues? So if we're looking at some of the issues that women would have with a normal traditional club, here are some of the items. So the first thing is their careers. We have women who are entrepreneurs, lawyers, doctors, teachers um, in, in media, in aerospace, so many different types of careers that they have. And so a lot of times those careers really require a lot of hours during the week, um, not only at the job, but also at home as well. And so to commit to a club three, four days a week for about three hours is very difficult once you get to a particular age. And so we wanted to make that obviously something that didn't hinder them from joining our club. Another item is families. We have women who have up to three to four children. And if you have three to four children, you're looking at after school programs, you're looking at extracurricular activities, you're looking at homework after school and on the weekends. And so it's very difficult once again to commit three to four days a week and then on the weekends. And so uh, we'll get to how we were able to help our mothers. And you're looking at geo, um, geographical location. We're located, our club is considered to be a GTA club, Greater Toronto Area, but we have women coming from uh, Niagara, we have women coming from different provinces, we have women coming from other types of countries. And so um, let's just focus on the GTA. You're looking at anywhere from about a half an hour to an hour and a half to two hours driving in traffic just to get to training sessions. And so once again, if you have a family, you have career responsibilities, taking anywhere from three to four hours to commute and then another two to three hours in your training is very difficult. 
And so that became an issue as well. The cost, you have to look at finances. If you have certain types of responsibilities to, uh, you know, reserve 400 to $500 on yourself for the summer for a rugby club because club becomes very difficult when you have responsibilities and you have a family and you have other programs for your children that you need to cover. Availability, once again, that comes into the fact that a lot of women just didn't have the time for the training and the games altogether. And tradition, even though a lot of these women are able to play at a high level and they're able to actually uh, come to the, the games without training and do well, the tradition still lies that when you come to training, you play. And a lot of women just felt uncomfortable going to training and just jumping on the field, on the roster and starting. And so a lot of them kind of stepped away from rugby because they couldn't commit to the training sessions, even though the team may wanted them to attend the games, even though they didn't commit to the training sessions, it just wasn't something that they felt comfortable doing. And the next is health. A lot of injuries uh, that uh, occurred during their university years or college years or during their club years, provincial, national level, those injuries become something that you now think about when you're 30 plus because a sprained ankle that took a few days to heal when you were in your 20s, now in your, your 30s and 40s and 50s, takes like sometimes anywhere from two to three weeks, depending on if you have the, the access to treatment. And so that may affect your career, that may affect your issues at home with your family. And so a lot of women are very hesitant to take on that uh, situation when it comes to possible injuries, obviously with the contact sports such as rugby. And so we had to take in all these items and we sat at the table and we thought about all these items that would hinder a woman from joining a club. And, and we spoke to a lot of women and we thought we needed to find this holistic approach that would allow women to be able to play, but still not have to deal with all these items. So why do they play for the guardian angel? So the first thing is decreased commitment, but still not affecting the level of play. So we are in a premier league and the premier league for the women's league, you need to have two tiers, tier one and tier two. It's called the first and the seconds. And so we uh, propped our team right into the seconds. So you're still playing a mixture of players uh, who are in the club for the first time or played club for many years in university um, on, on the national team or looking to be on the national team, on the provincial team. So it's a mixture and a plethora of different types of identities where the rugby level is still at a very high level. Our games are at 11 o'clock every single Saturday. So you have the opportunity to play very early. And if they want to stay, they can stay. But if they have to leave, they can leave. And they still have the rest of the day to attend to their responsibilities or their, their family items or even um, dealing with some of the things that their, their children may be dealing with in terms of sports as well. And so uh, you're looking at women now with this opportunity to not have to attend training, not driving in traffic for three hours, is just basically come to play on the Saturdays at 11 o'clock. And then now you're able to balance your work, your life and your sport um, lifestyles because you don't have this um, very, very commit, this heavy commitment of three to four days a week as well as the games. So another item that we, we looked at is babysitting. We said, how can we get women with children to come and play rugby and feel comfortable um, with the, uh, the idea of leaving the home or their responsibilities at home for several uh, hours? So we decided to, in our fees, we included an ECE, a qualified ECE at every single practice, or sorry, every single game. And so the women bring their children and uh, the qualified ECE does activities with them and um, you know, plays games with them. Uh, the parents bring their snacks, obviously, um, allergy issues and things like that, but the children are well taken care of. Uh, they have little tents and, and toys and things like that. And so the children are able to see their, their mothers uh, play, but then also the mothers are able to see that their children are being taken care of and they actually have the opportunity for their children to see them play as well. And so uh, when we look at also mentorship on and off of the field, you have a lot of talk on the field. We have women who've played for anywhere from 10 to 30 years. And so there are times where certain penalties would be given and there's some confusion. The refs don't always have time to, to speak on those things. And you will see little conversations happening between our members and the players on other teams. After the games, you have a lot of the women who are speaking to a lot of these younger players. Some of these younger players realize they played for the same university team, except you know the, the mature member years ago, and now they're currently at the university. Some of the members donate to the university. Some of those members started the program. Some of those members sit on the board office of those programs. And so these younger players who are growing into the sport of rugby are able to 
have mentorship after the game and, and exchange numbers and information in case obviously they're interested in something moving forward. And the last I have is a continued tra tra tradition. A lot of rugby players enjoy the player to player, um, you know, I guess you can say tradition of having a little gathering after the games. That's where a lot of the, the talking, the talks happen. That's where a lot of exchanges happen. And also, you know, there's food and there's drinks. And so if you haven't been part of a rugby program, you're not able to be a part of that. And so now that they're here with our team, they're able to do that and they can stay for as long or as least as they can stay and still be a part of that tradition that they longed for um, for so many years, especially for those who are away from it for a very long time. Nurturing their mental wellness, the sisterhood. The sisterhood is so important. The sisterhood in a rugby, I have a lot of people from other sports say that the sisterhood and even the brotherhood in rugby is like no other. And so having that opportunity to be a part of that again um, is, is amazing. And that's something that we, we cherish as part, of our, as part of our program. And the last is the experience. Our first year, over 75% of our players played at a national level. And so you're, you have the, the amount of experience that stepped onto the field was just amazing. And to know that that experience is nurturing uh, the next generation is kind of where we got our names, uh, our name kind of derived from that, the guardian angel. So basically guardians of the sport and helping the sport to continue to be the best that it can be um, from women sharing their opportunities and sharing this, this moment on the pitch with other women. So how does this increase representation? So the first thing is you have the founders where you have Karen and Devine and myself, we were able to invest in a women's program. And so that allows us obviously to, to represent women and also to, to support women. Then we're looking at the business perspective of things behind the scenes. We were very particular on who represented us when it came to donations. We wanted donations from women and, and women businesses because as was spoken in the last, um, you know, in a few other webinars is the glass ceiling. A lot of these teams you can see on the, on, in certain types of, um, you know, coffee shops or, or restaurants and things like that. The sponsorship of a lot of these sport teams is usually businesses owned and run by men. And so for the first time, we had the opportunity to have women represent themselves and to show their branding of their companies and what they're um, investing their time into. And so we thought that was very important Important to reach out to women so that we could represent women on the business sector of things. And more specifically with our kit, we wanted our kit to be made by a woman. We wanted our kit to be, we wanted our kit to be made in Canada and, and specifically, obviously, to avoid any of those types of um, issues with sweatshops and things like that. We want to be very aware of the environment as well. And so we decided that we would go to Barbara Mervin. Barbara Mervin played for Canada for many years in the 15s program. And she started her own women's uh, company when it comes to rugby gear. And so we thought it was uh, obviously amazing that we could go to her and, and ask for her guidance and also ask for her to be a part of this. And she was super excited. Uh, you can see through the pictures that I'm showing you, uh, the kit, um, it's amazing, it's gorgeous, it's, it's fierce, it's strong, it's powerful. Um, and so, um, and it really sits with obviously our idea of being guardian angels. And so we wanted also to choose colors that weren't necessarily represented with other clubs. A lot of the women uh, thought, you know, it was very difficult to leave their club and then to join another club because, you know, you have that tradition. And so if we had similar colors to their club, it, it would kind of be a little bit difficult. And that was something that we um, women spoke to us about. And so that's why we decided to go with the gold and black. It was definitely no other color like that in Ontario. And so uh, looking at the diverse medical staff, because our, our accounting and our, our medical side of things was handled by Dr. Crowback, who owns a sports clinic, she was able to have a diverse medical staff when it comes to uh, gender and race as well. And so having that in um, being part of our team was very important. Um, supporting our, our community in terms of I have here generational support. With our team being present, you are now seeing grandparents and parents and, and, and children all on the sidelines. And, you know, if you have a player who's 49 years old, uh, their mother and their grandparent is going to be a lot different um, in age than someone who's 22. And so that was very uh, important for us to have that community and that family being uh, represented on the sidelines as well. Uh, youth exposed to strong women in leadership roles. 
because we are a team of, of women who have all played at such a high level, uh, we didn't have a coach. We don't have a coach. Uh, each woman takes on a different task at a different game, uh, different training, uh, you know, different um, warm up session. And so you can see now uh, all these mothers and these women um, on the field as leaders and their children and their, their spouses and their family members can see that. And that's something that we don't see a lot. We don't see a lot of, of women at a particular age in sport. And, and that goes for many sports. And then the community is exposed to fathers and nurturing and supportive roles. It's very important for us to show that perspective of fathers and to show the, the side of family that you usually don't see in media. It is, it's important for us um, to show the children this as well and the community. And so that's why I included that image of that father holding the baby uh, because we saw a lot of that. And you usually see it the other way around. And it's important that our children can see the other side of things as well. And so if we're looking at the, the bigger picture, uh, we're looking at increased registration for Ontario and, and for Canada. Uh, we're looking at age representation. So now we, uh, we have women who are playing from 30 to about 55 plus. We have players who are returning into the game, you know, a year being off, but we had a player who was returning with 19 years off. And so you have that huge gap of never of not playing. And so you can imagine the excitement of being able to touch the field again and experience that stuff that they've experienced many years ago. Um, and with this being said, now you have women because they don't have that heavy commitment of being on a particular traditional rugby team, they can now referee, they can now coach. And not only can they coach at the club level because their Saturdays and their weekends are freed up, they can now coach at the provincial level because a lot of times provincial coaching is happening on the Saturdays, happening on the Sundays. And then you also have uh, these women, a lot of our women coach their children in um, their little um, rugby leagues. And so before they weren't able to do such things like that. So it's giving them the opportunity because we're not restricting their time. And then you have... Um, you know, increased representation. So when you see these other, when you see these women in these roles, these leadership roles, you have these younger players and these players growing in the sport coming to these women to ask for advice and ask questions. And then also being motivated now to take on refereeing courses, to take on coaching courses and to take on coaching roles and to gain that confidence because many times in the rugby world, males are what we see. And so when you have these after off the pitch mentorship programs and and when I mean programs, I mean just a simple chat off the, you know, after the games, you have women who are able to see this and, and, and be encouraged and motivated. So I do have a little bit of a video about um, our rugby club. Aaron, what do we have for time? Um, so I'd say you probably have about five more minutes and then that leaves us about six minutes for questions. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the video and then I'll go to the, the next part of the presentation, which is um, very quick and just looking at coaching and what representation looks like. And so we'll see. So our club was uh, represented in the Globe and Mail. It's a national, it's a, you can you see the video there? Perfect. Yep. It was represented in the newspaper. They heard about us and they thought it was a, a very uh, inspiring idea. And so they came and um, they took pictures. They made a video um, about our rugby program and the women involved in the rugby program. And uh, it was a good day because we won the, the, the championship. So they were able to put that all in the video. Um, but more specifically, um, at the end of the year, this uh, story won the um, athletic story of the year for, um, for Canada. So it was very exciting to actually be nominated and then actually win and so um it was really uh cool to actually be a part of that so i'll play it without further ado i'll play the video here about our club let's face it rugby is a man's world it really is it's very rare that you see an organization that's started by women run by women sponsored by women everything's done by the women it's super cool <laughs> We don't want to retire from rugby. We're, you know, fit enough to continue playing rugby, but what opportunities do we have? And so we thought, well, what can we do? And we're just like, well, let's just start it. Nice. What we're doing is we're creating a community again. 
And so it's just amazing being a part of a team that's run by women and for women. I had my first and then came back and played kind of a couple of games and loved it, but really kind of couldn't do the mom thing while I was also committing to play. When they come out, if they don't have to find a sitter and spend money out of their pocket, they don't have to worry about that stress because what we did was we hired a babysitter for every single game. He was four months at my first game. <laughs> Most people thought I was crazy. And my husband said, if I come back with a broken leg, he's not taking care of me. <laughs> but and I am so glad I didn't listen to anybody because it has been the best decision ever. <laughs> You know, there's a special bond when a woman has a child, you know, even though you might have an extremely supportive husband that's saying, go do stuff, honey, get out of the house, go do your passion, play your sport. Yet there's that certain aspect of guilt. And it's very often looked at as being selfish as a woman. And I think we're trying to really get rid of that stigma. It really is nice to see them doing what they love and seeing all the dads out there with the little baby carriers on, rooting on their wife. Everyone's sold on the vibe and when you have women who are all on the same page and things just work. I definitely miss being around a community of women and Rugby communities are strong women and empowering women, and um, I really did miss that. And so being back and having that in my life again this summer has just been fantastic in every sense. Okay, so... Uh the last uh, two minutes, I'm just going to uh, show you uh, what does it look like, an example of representation in coaching. And so um, I had the opportunity to coach for five years at the college level. And a lot of times when you're uh, coaching at the college level, you have a lot of males um, in those positions. Um, I started in 2014 as a assistant coach. The head coach stepped down and I stepped, at, I stepped up as the head coach. And um, the other assistant coach was a female. And so when uh, she decided to step down, the first thing that I decided to do is I decided to keep my staff all female. And um, it was something that I asked the college for. Uh, I asked them for permission if I could hire uh, who I wanted to hire. And what I was thinking about also, I was also thinking about age as well. A lot of young players don't get opportunities to coach because a lot of people say they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the experience. And so what I did is I decided to hire young coaches. And here are some images here. You have uh, Tierra Thomas Reynolds. Uh, you also have on the left here below there, you have Mackenzie Fain. On the right there um, in the black uniform, you have Ariel Dubset Boris. And then you also have up in the red there, you have Mackenzie Higgs. All these women either played uh, sevens or fifteens league or union. Uh, three of us played uh, dual sports at a national level. And the, uh, the lens was just amazing because they were never given that chance to coach at such a level. And given that opportunity, um, it created um, inclusion and representation. And that was something that I was very um, keen on doing. And so uh, 2015, our coaching staff, um, I got coach of the year, but to me, it's the whole coaching staff. And so, you know, evidence that this can work and this can be something that um, women achieve if we're given the opportunities. Uh, 2018, 2019 was a very special year for us. It was our year where we had an all black staff. Um, uh, to be honest with you at the college level, I think the all female staff is a historical. Um, I don't know how many teams have that at the college level. And then also um, all black staff is pretty historical. And so that was something where I wanted to have um, a diverse lens and having this diverse lens when it comes to having younger coaches, um, diverse in terms of, of race. When we recruit, we're able to recruit um, different women um, of the sort. And um, I had the education system there because it works. In the education system, when you have diverse um, curriculum, when you have diverse uh, teaching staff, uh, you do see more successful students. And it's the same thing with coaching as well. And so we were very, very keen on having women, a women's staff, a woman's staff, so we can support the mental health of our women. Um, and because we were all we are all still playing rugby and we all know the, the dynamic of, of rugby and education and then balancing your, your, your family life and things like that. 
Um, and then also supporting women in education. A lot of the recruiting at times uh, when uh, people aren't aware of the importance of women in education, they try to um, you know, give them some false, uh, false information or even not keen on the, the studying and the study hall and the, the grades. And so that's something that we were obviously very keen on. And so the last slide here is just looking at if we are given the opportunities uh, to develop as coaches, um, to develop different coaching philosophies and to, to continue our lifelong learning, we need to be given different opportunities. How, are, how do we occupy these spaces as rugby players, but then also as coaches? And we need to understand that. And so part of the wild committee, um, we were able to go to um, Curcell and we we're able to meet with other types of players and other types of coaches. And those are opportunities that are given to women that are amazing and that still need to uh, continue. And Rand gave us that opportunity. Um, conferences, uh, the conference that I, I went to was the national conference. It was amazing to see uh, Michael speak as the, as the key speaker there. You see his image there uh, as a keynote speaker, but I would have loved to see a woman as well. And that's something, uh, how are we occupying spaces? And we need to occupy spaces at conferences as well. Um, I have a picture here of, of Pinball Clements because I wanted to um, ask about coaching philosophies and how to start certain programs. And many years ago, I spoke with him and got some information. And that's not kind of some of the stuff that I, I carried on in terms of with the guardian angels. And so having opportunities to go to workshops and to go to conferences where women are represented, uh, that, that is important. Um, an example of representation here is Maria Thomas recently uh, wrote about the guardian angels for her master's programs in the, uh, at the Russian International Olympic University. And that's a key example of representation in literature. And so having um, access to all these types of, of um, platforms is important for women. And with these opportunities, women are more likely to want to get into refereeing and want to get into coaching once they know that they're supported at these levels. Uh, so that's what I have to share with all of you. And so I'll stop there and let Erin uh, continue on. Yeah, There's we have some questions, questions uh, for you, Tamara. Sure. Um, so if you want to pass the hosting back uh, to me while we're doing this. Um, so we'll take about five minutes here and do some questions. Um, so uh, Joe Sanchez, thank you, Joe, for sending in some questions. Also wanted to just note, he said, great idea, uh, hardly any legacy of women in his area. So some really good ideas taking from, from your presentation. Um, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're aware of the percentage, and I'm not either, but um, do you, are you aware of the, the percentage of players that continue on to play from university to club level um, in, in your area or in, in our area? It's actually something that is that we're struggling with, to be honest with you. Um, and we're struggling with this because the numbers are significantly low. Uh, we current, about two years ago, we went to a, a Rugby Ontario meeting and we're looking at women. So once they finish university, their fourth or fifth year, they will play for about three years on average. And that's about it. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I think same, same in the U S and, um, and, and probably in our region, it's, it's not usually at those transition points, you're not getting a very large number, but I think if you take anything from Tamara's presentation, I hope she's recreating the environment that, probably women had in a college university level and recreating that in the club level. And I think that's, what's really important is to make sure you're recreating that experience for them because likely they had a great time and that connection and that network. And they need to have that again at that club level. Mm -hmm. um, a second just person, just question, uh, what's, what do you think is more important in terms of community rugby or representative rugby in terms of keeping players in the game, player retention? Good question. I'm also going to add to the last question. Oh, yeah. uh, the men have had what we have for many years. Like it's, 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 it's a thing for the men. They have the thirties plus the forties plus the fifties plus the old boys. So it's, it's, it's kind of not really new, but new for women. So it's kind of something that we didn't really re recreate, but I wanted to add there that the men have been doing that for years, but for, for some reason for the women, it wasn't considered traditional or even the norm. So just adding that too, but with that question, it represent uh, representation or, so, so community level or uh, like what's kind of what more community level rugby or representative rugby? And what would be your definition of community level rugby? Um, so Joe, maybe you can clarify on that. I'm, I'm interpreting it more of like, um, so I know you had a lot of players that had played at a national level. So kind of playing at a higher level. So kind of representing at a higher level versus more just yeah. maybe general club recreation play. Okay. So, you know, that, that's a question that a lot of, a lot of the, the members outside of our program actually um, 
are interested in. They say, you know, you did really well in this level. Do you ever think of, of doing something at a higher level? And it's a very good question. And so part of our program is we had about 29 women register the first year. And the second year, I think we had maybe about 25 or 26. And so with our program, um, women are committed to, they're not committed every single week. So we won't, we'll have a key amount of players, a core set of players that come every week. But a lot of times women commit to about three games or four games, maybe two games. Uh, we've had international players come in for two weeks. And so because we um, go to these games um, at times with, you know, 22 players or maybe even a little bit less, um, it'd be very difficult to go at a higher level. At a higher level, we want to make sure that we have um, the solid, you know, uh, 20, you know, maybe about 25 players able to attend the game um, every single week. And so what our goal is, is to have this program here for the tier two. But the moment that we are able to register anywhere from about 45 and up women, uh, we will definitely increase to the tier one. And the tier one level, obviously, is where you'll have more national players, provincial players, and high level university players as well at that level. And so that is our goal to have two teams. Um, but right now with um, a situation where we're going to games with anywhere from 17 to, you know, 21, maybe on a, on a good day, 23 players, um, it's very difficult to, um, to go at a, to, to play at a high level because we also have players not only um, that played at a high level, but we also have players that just played maybe club or maybe just high school or haven't played in many years and their fitness levels are different. And so not everybody's able to play that 80 minutes. And so we got to look at safety, we got to look at game time, and then we also got to look at what are we able to, to compete in consistently. Could we compete at a higher level one or two weeks and do well? Absolutely. But for the full season, not currently. Awesome. So um, probably time for two more questions. Um, so Ruth asks, uh, do you think it would be easier to begin as a coach, women coaching female teams or younger teams instead of maybe going after a men's team? Is that a, maybe an easier approach to getting started in coaching? It's a, that's a good question. And it, real, it really all depends on uh, your personality and your comfort. Um, myself as a high school coach, I've coached uh, females and boys. And um, when I've done some guest coaching um, at the provincial or national levels, I've coached both as well. Um, I'm comfortable doing so, um, but I'm also a teacher. And so I work with both genders um, very um, you know, freely throughout my career. But it really depends on what you're comfortable with. And to be honest with you, um, it doesn't really matter. It really doesn't really matter. Um, they're just grateful to have a coach that's uh, interested in their, in their sport and interested in their growth. And they will definitely take on to, to, new, to new identities to the program. And so whatever you have access to. And so you may have access to, uh, you may only have access to a certain types of teams. And if that's what you have access to and that's what you want to start with, that's pretty much what you should start with. But I wouldn't say looking at gender um, um, would be an issue. Now, the higher level that you go, um, it may be an issue depending on the, the program management and the, the other coaching staff possibly. But um, for starting out for, you know, younger players, if you're looking at college and below, um, I don't really have a suggestion. I think just go with what's available. Perfect. Um, and then last question for you. Um, so for the men on the call and the men who are coaching uh, women's clubs, how can they help? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this. And I know, Jake, you also had a question, too, about how can we make, attract more female coaches to that environment? So I'll address some of that, but just want to give you a chance to to how can the men help out? Uh, you know, uh, the question specifically asks, are we taking the spots of women or what are ways that we can um, maybe help bring women into that and support them? It's a great question. Um, you know, some of my, some of the, I mean, the great coaches in my life have been men as, as well. You know, very few have I had of women, but um, you don't want them to disappear um, because their knowledge is important. Their, their lens is important. But what I do suggest is, is bring in uh, guests, guest speakers, guest athletes or guest coaches that are women. And so if you know, as a man that you're there um, and you're, you're occupying that space, the best thing to do is to share that space. And, and that could be done with um, having guest coaches. And, and I did that as myself as having an all woman staff. I thought it was very important to have the male perspective as well as also a different perspective. So I had referees come as guests, as guest um, speakers and, and coaches for the day. Um, and then also, you know, watching video footage as well um, of guest speakers, if you can't have them come to your, your, you know, your, your setting. 
but representation is very important in, in how you occupy that space. And it's important that you share that space with that, uh, the other gender, however you can based on your situation.